Are you ready to dive into the dynamic world of entrepreneurship and discover the keys to success? On this episode of the Career Discovery Podcast, we're excited to introduce you to Tim, a co-founder and CEO in the software development industry, specializing in financial well-being solutions for the employee benefits industry. Tim generously shares his insights into the world of entrepreneurship, providing valuable information, inspiration from his career journey, and empowering advice for aspiring entrepreneurs and professionals alike. We explore a wide range of topics, from the nuances of the different roles within entrepreneurship to the essential qualities for success. Tim also sheds light on how university choices can impact our potential and the importance of maintaining positive professional relationships throughout your career. From the challenges he's faced to his proudest moments, Tim's journey offers invaluable lessons to everybody looking to thrive in their career. Plus, he shares strategies for overcoming imposter syndrome, building a strong network and achieving happiness and fulfillment at work. So get ready for a captivating conversation that will inspire you to explore new horizons, discover your professional potential and embark on your career journey with confidence. Enjoy the show. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Seth. Thanks for having me. All right. How about we get started? Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and how long you've been doing it for. Okay. So, yeah, I'm, uh, my name's Tim. Um, I am co-founder and CEO of a company called Nudge, uh, which is my own company. So I set Nudge up um, with my co-founder about 10 years ago now. We've got our 10th, uh, 10th birthday actually coming up at the end of this month. And we, we help people, mainly employees, better understand and better manage their money. Fantastic. And, th- and congratulations on your anniversary. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, and no, we've got a big party planned. It's going to be good. Very good. Well <laughs> deserved. Now, before we get into your career journey and so on, this is a podcast. So tell us what you're mm-hmm. listening to right now and um, enjoying. Ooh, um, uh, what do I listen to? Uh, I think my go-to podcast is probably the News Agents. Um, yep. Not sure if you've heard of that one, um, but it's uh, I find it as a really good way to kind of understand the news in a bit more detail, which I yeah. think is pretty important for my role. Um, and uh, I also enjoy the price of football, which I can highly recommend. So somebody who likes business and likes football, you know, it's a perfect combination. Yeah. Is the news agents, is that the one with Emily Maitlis? That's the one. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. John Sokol and I can't remember yeah. the other guy's name, but uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's really good. Oh, fab. And that's the thing I love about podcasts, something for everyone and also every kind of mood that you're in, which is great. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. All right. Yeah. So, so many misconceptions about the work we do. So I'm wondering what the common misconceptions are of your work. What do friends and family think you're doing all day? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think they think I'm in meetings all of the day, um, you know, sat in a room around a table. Um I think they probably think that I'm a bit of an expert at everything um, because I'm running the business. They probably think I need to know how it all all works. Um, but uh, whilst I do do a lot of meetings, they're not necessarily all sat around the table. So, for example, um, earlier today I had a meeting and it was a walking meeting. So we our office is near St. James's Park. And so yeah. myself and my colleague did a couple of laps of there. Um, and uh, and basically my job is just making decisions which don't always require a meeting so that's encouraging yeah yeah fantastic thank you and and actually while we're while we're on this um part of the conversation um you're you're you founded the company but you're also running the company as ceo i wonder if you might give us um i don't know the key differences between the founder role the ceo and any other i guess prominent roles um that that are on that senior table that can often get confused with those terms yeah 
Um, so, you know, the founder is the person who, who finds the business, who sets the business up. Um, as I say, I was very lucky that I'm a co-founder. So I set yeah. the business up with a you know really good mate of mine who I've worked with for 10 years before we set the business up. And, and that, for anybody thinking about setting a business up, I really encourage you to have a co-founder because there are some yeah. pretty dark moments. And what we tend to find mm. is that when I'm down, he's up and vice versa. Um, yeah. The, and I think it, it's then typical that as the business grows and you start to have employees, that that founder role becomes the, what's called the C-suite. So yeah. um, that might be a CEO, so chief executive officer. That might be a COO, so chief operating officer, so making sure the business runs itself. It might be a CCO, so chief commercial officer, so making sure the money's coming in. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so my, my role uh, as founder is to kind of look after the business and, 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 and I guess, make sure that, you know, it's growing and we're managing our shareholders and what have you. The role of a CEO is more operational. So thinking about actually yeah. running the business and all, all of my reports, they report yeah. into me as CEO as opposed to founder. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. So, so now, now we've um, you know debunked some of the misconceptions. Can you tell us what um, your organisation relies on you for, um, you know, to deliver for your employees and your clients in that role of CEO? Yeah. Um, so I think that in my role is very diverse. Firstly, you know, and that's yeah. the thing that. I've I think I like about it. You know, every day is very, very different. Um, yeah. You know, maybe we'll talk about you know typical day later. But at a broad level, uh, my job is to kind of set the strategy. So, are we going to look at winning lots of clients in America? Are we going to look at winning instead lots of clients in Africa? Are we not going to focus on winning any more new clients and just focus on our existing clients? Um, yeah, you know, are we going to borrow more money? Or are we going to keep the purse strings tied nice and tight? So it's it's that yeah. kind of strategy. Um, yeah. you know, where do we think the business is going? Um, I think the other key element of, of my role is sorting the big problems. You know, I've got an amazing mm. team. There's about 100, 100, just over 100 people in the business and incredibly capable team. But occasionally there's a problem that kind of boils up to me. So I spend a bit of time yeah. sorting problems. Um and then the other element is that kind of shareholder management piece. So every month we have to produce reports and, and occasionally there's things that need to be approved. So, for example, borrowing more money from the bank would yeah. need to be approved mm -hmm. or hiring somebody particular senior, that would need to be approved. So a lot of my role is that external shareholder management. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Now, you told us a little bit about your business at the top of the conversation, but I'm wondering if you can tell us um, about the, the, I guess, the sector or industry that this fits into and tell us a little bit about that industry or sector. Yeah. OK, so yeah, the industry that we sit in is called employee benefits. And so that is a subset of HR or human resources. So when a business gets to normally, I don't know, maybe 30, 40, 50 people, they will have somebody, they will have a department specifically focused on looking after the employees. So recruiting them, motivating them, um, helping with their problems and so on. And, and part of the role within HR is managing employee benefits. Um, yeah. And the employee benefits industry has evolved a huge amount, you know, even in the 20 years that I've, I've been working in it. I think Traditionally, employee benefits were set up for the purpose of the business. It was to protect the mm -hmm. business. Um, but you know, particularly in the last two or three decades, it's been much more about kind of perks and benefits for mm -hmm. the employees. Um, yeah. And uh, so whether that is things like a pension to ensure people can still get an income after they've finished working or whether that's an insurance. So if somebody gets injured or something goes wrong, they get paid out. Whether that's things like um, childcare vouchers, so you can get uh, help from your employer to pay for childcare, which is very expensive. So 
the yeah. sector is employee benefits, which, which sits yeah. within within HR. Okay, great. And and tell us a little bit about more where where your business and your mission fits into that sector. Yeah. Um, so I mean, what I remember being in an assembly at school, like probably in year ten, and I remember the yeah. head teacher a long time ago, and the head teacher said, uh, I remember him saying, um, in I don't know twenty years time or whatever, I forget the percentage, but the majority of you will be doing jobs that have that haven't yet been invented that don't exist yet. Yeah. And I was thinking that's ridiculous. You know, I was thinking fireman, ambulance teacher, yeah. they're all still going to exist. But he was absolutely right. So you know, this this yeah. job, this industry didn't really exist. And so the I guess the the business case, you know, the 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 reason that an organisation that an employer would invest in a program like ours so we pay for a program like ours is the fact that money is really complicated you know, personal finance yeah. is very complicated and it's very dangerous you can make yeah. one small incorrect decision you know that might be maxing out a credit card to go to Ibiza with your mates and then that problem grows yeah. and it lasts with yeah. you for decades and it can cause all sorts of chaos with your later life and so uh, not only is that obviously devastating for the employee, that can be very costly for their employer as well. So on the basis yeah. that money's really complicated and you need to be very careful about it, our service um, helps people with that. So we help people better understand their money, um, start to live a more positive and proactive life with their money. And, yeah. um, and uh, as part of that, there's all sorts of benefits that come to the employer as well. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful because I think that I think that the, you know, financial literacy is really really quite mixed, isn't it? And there's not there's not a huge amount of uh, financial education taught in schools and so on. So it's it's, you know, it's no. no it isn't a wonder why people kind of come into the workplace and struggle to manage their money or know what how to, you know, make the most of it and so on. Yeah, no, it, it's it's a real shame, and and I mean, our service we deliver this across the world. And whilst this is a problem globally, I'd say it's a particularly big problem here in the UK. Um, wow. I think the problem is that although the government um, or people like Martin Lewis encourage schools to talk to yeah. people and and help people with their money, um, it's not part of the national curriculum. And and you know, if a school is really good at helping people understand their money, that doesn't help them in the league tables. So as a result, right. they don't really focus on yeah. it. They focus on science and maths and the things that are going to make yeah. them look good in the league tables. So a lot of what we're doing, you know, we're speaking to people saying, do you know what, I wish I had, had this support 10, 15, 20 years ago, or, you know, I wish yeah. I could provide this type of support for my, for my kids. Um, so, yeah, better late than never, um, but it's yes. not ideal. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Okay, so in your role as CEO, what would we find you doing on a in a typical week? Uh, oh my god! I mean, things are moving so quickly. I can't really remember one day to the next. I think if I think about today, um, as I say, it's different every day. Um, yeah. But if I think about today, so I was up nice and early this morning um, because I had a call with a client to be so what's called a prospect mm -hmm. so we hope there'll be a client at, at one point um who are based in australia so it was six yeah. o'clock for me i think that was four o'clock in the afternoon or something for them so yeah. i was uh i was doing a zoom call with them uh demonstrating our products and talking a bit about how it can help them um yeah i then took the kids to school um i then had a weekly i have a weekly briefing with our coo um, mm -hmm. And I did that whilst walking to work. So again, you know, it's a meeting, but I was walking yeah. across Clapham Common at the time. Um, and that's where he kind of reports up to me, you know, what's happening in the business, anything I need to be aware of, gives me some decisions that I need to make on stuff. Yeah. Um, I was then reviewing a client proposal. I was then interviewing somebody. I'm now yeah. doing this. Um, uh, we have a sales meeting this afternoon and then I've joined a an advisory board 
uh, mm -hmm. for an organization called HR.com, um, who okay. are a US organization. And um, I'm part of a group, I think there's about 12 of us, um, who are kind of sharing our experience of the industry for them to then publish to their, their readership. And so I have a, my day will end with a call with America. So I'm going straight from Australia at six yeah. o'clock this morning to America at eight o'clock, uh, eight o'clock yeah. this evening. Oh, so super varied. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, and, no day's the same as the other. And you've mentioned strategy is a big part of your role. But, you know, mm. what are the other big things that come up during the, you know, an average month or year that might the audience might um want to be aware of if they're they've got their sights set on this kind of role yeah um so i think the the the, the month all revolves around our monthly board meeting so yeah. this is where uh, this is a meeting of there's normally seven of us so that's myself and my co-founder our cfo which stands yeah. for Chief Financial Officer. So he's the person that looks after the financial side of the business. Um, our COO, so the guy I have the call with, walking across Clapham Common, yeah. he runs the business operationally. And then our external investors. So mm -hmm. about two and a half years ago now, um, we realized that the opportunity for us to provide our software to even more people was bigger than we had yeah. thought. Um, and we knew that the best way to do that was to raise some money. So as part yeah. of that, we sold part of the business to an organization called Kennet Partners. So they now own mm -hmm. a minority part of the business. And so as part of this monthly board meeting, we're updating them on our, our progress. What new clients yeah. have we won? What new employees have we hired? How much cash have we got in the bank? Um, yeah. yeah, those types of, those types of things. So that, that's the kind of the central fixed part of the month. Um, yeah. Beyond that, um, uh, it is around um, kind of reviewing our roadmap. So our, our yeah. solution is a piece of technology. So it's an, an app yeah. essentially. And so there's a monthly cycle that we go through in terms of reviewing how the app performed in the last month. What changes yeah. do we need to make for it to perform in the next month? Um, I also, normally fortnightly rather than monthly, I spend a lot of time with new joiners as well. So we have lots of yeah. new people joining the organization. And so, um, yeah, I have, we have a meet the founders session where I get to know them, understand yeah. a bit more about what they've done, why they've joined us, and then talk to them a bit about the journey that we're on and, and yeah. try and get them excited and motivated yeah. for their, their career with us. Yeah. Well, that sounds fantastic. Thank you. And are there any other like really, um, I guess, highlights that stand out? So I'm, I'm thinking, are there awards in your industry or, you know, celebratory moments? Or I know, um, you know, Q1 is often um, a heavy comp season for organisations. So does yeah. that impact you? Yeah, so we... Um... The, the people that we're selling to, so the, the reward people, which is, I say, yeah. or employee benefits, which is this subset of HR, they have a fairly predictable year. So they, yeah. they are normally spending the same period of time each year looking at pay reviews for their people. They review their benefits at the same time of the year. Yes, it's quite predictable, yeah. um, which means there's definitely a kind of an annual rhythm to our business. So what we yeah. tend to find is that we... Uh, our, our financial year runs from October through to September. So when yeah. we talk about Q1, that's our first quarter. Yeah. And so yeah. that October, November, December time, that's when we win lots of new clients. Um, yeah. And then the kind of January, February, March is about us launching those clients. And then remaining six months, whenever that is, is about doing the marketing for the beginning yeah. of the next year to win more clients. Um, yeah. So I, I love that that period we're coming into now where we're winning lots of new clients and that every client we win gives us an opportunity to celebrate. So, for example, yesterday yeah. we won Monzo. So I'm sure lots oh, of people yeah. will be familiar with, with Monzo, the bank. So they signed yeah. a contract with us yesterday. So we're celebrating that. 
Um, yeah. Because we've got people in probably 20 different countries now. So every quarter, um, so yeah. every three months, we have an all company meeting where we update people on how we performed over the previous three months and then yeah. set people up for the next three months. Um, that normally mm-hmm. ends up in a bit of a party. So that's always a fun, yeah. fun time. Um, and, and also everybody in the business shares the same bonus scheme. So the, the bonus that people earn is dependent yeah. on the success of the business, how the business has yeah. grown. And so yeah. that's a great opportunity for us to usually give people good news that the business yeah. has grown and therefore give them that confirmation that they're, they're going to be getting the bonus. So that, yeah. that's, those quarterlies are a particularly exciting phase. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm really curious about the, 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 the kind of departments that sit within your organization because I think one of the um, one of the problems um, some some people in the audience might find is they see you know a role like HR for example and they think that's just one mm-hmm. role but of course there are you know eight role eight or eight or so mini departments that sit behind the umbrella of HR yeah. so I'm wondering if you could kind of share the the typical departments or roles that sit within your business yeah um so we we have sales our biggest um our biggest department is is sales and yeah um in that i include marketing as well so yeah. marketing is a team of probably five people now whose job it is to look after our website uh, yeah. whose job it is to make sure that we appear on google as high as possible their job is to help us create brochures that explain what our product does Um, and then we've got sales working alongside them so when we think that there's a client who's interested in our service we have a salesperson who reaches out to them books a demonstration and starts that conversation Um, alongside that we have our engineering team so these are the guys who are coding so yeah. um, designing the product um, and you know, that's, that's a big team and certainly seen a lot of growth over the last few years. And even within that, there's then lots of different roles. So there's yeah. the people who are working on the structure, the architecture. Um, there's the people who are actually putting the code in that means that button's red and that button's blue. And then you have what we call QA, so quality assurance. So there's a team there who are checking that that red button and blue button are the colours that they should be and not the other way around. Yeah. Um, you then have, you know, we, we hold a lot of sensitive information about our yeah. clients. So information security is a huge part yeah. of that tech team as well. Um, we then have content. So our job is to provide people with in the moment, personalised financial education, and that's built on content. So that's built on us understanding yeah. how pensions work in Malaysia or whether yeah. cryptocurrency is, um, I don't know, is legal in Cambodia or whatever it might be. And so we have a team of, of people who are creating that content and loading that into the technology. Um, yeah. We have finance. So yeah. we have the people who are checking that they're raising the invoices to make sure clients pay us and then they're chasing clients up to make sure they pay us on time. Um, we have HR who are making sure that the, the business is, is running in terms of people are happy and we've got the right employees and people are rewarded properly. Uh, is that it? I hope I haven't missed anybody. That'd be embarrassing, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, yeah, I think, I think that's pretty, pretty main. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. I think it's always helpful mm-hmm. to pull back the curtain if you can. Um, yeah. I'm really curious. You said the business started nearly 10 years ago. Was it always an app-based product or does it, did it start off as a web-based product? Um, yeah, so it, is, it, it, was, it was a web-based product before yeah. we had an app. In reality, yeah. and this, without wanting to get too technical about it, the way that most clients actually um, serve it up to their employees yeah. is via a web rather than an app. Right, I but, see. You know, yeah. it, the product has evolved a, a huge amount. I yeah. 
I sometimes cringe when I think back to how simple and rubbish the product was when we first launched it. But it's come it's come a long way since. Yeah. It was the MVP, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> yes. Minimum viable product. Yeah, we use that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So Tim, you've already mentioned that you love the variety, but tell us what else you love about your role. Um, uh, oh, so, so I love the variety. Uh, I love being my own boss. I like yeah. not having anybody to tell me what to do. Um, yeah. I'm probably unemployable now, if truth be told. You know, <laughs> if I just have to go and get a job somewhere else, I'm not sure I'd last long. Um I, I guess at heart of it, though, I love what we're actually doing. Um, yeah. You know, I've got mates who work in banks or insurance companies, and um, they're not really doing anything. You know, there's not they're not producing anything. Whereas what yeah. I love about this is it's very tangible. You know, we provide yeah. the service to people, and their behaviours are changing. You know, people are yeah. saving more as a result of our service or they're borrowing less or they're paying off their credit card sooner or they are setting up a agreement with what's called a lasting power of attorney so you know if you find yourself in poor health you've got a structure for how your money is going to be looked after so i i I love the fact that it's very very tangible um Yeah. yeah that that's ultimately where the motivation comes from yeah. Well, it sounds as though you're having a positive impact on many people and that, that feels really good, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, when we get kind of case studies and references and feedback and, and people saying, you know, this has changed me for the better, um, yeah. you know, I will die a very happy man with that in mind. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned um, about, you know, really enjoying being your own boss. And I do think that... Uh, sometimes especially recently there's a lot of talk about entrepreneurship and which is brilliant because I don't think there's been enough of it in the past but I think that you know entrepreneurship isn't for everybody so I'm wondering what qualities um you feel have helped you um you know found and run this really successful business that others might want to be you know sense check if they if they have similar qualities um you've got to be a bit mad um <laughs> certainly to, to set the set the business up at the stage that i did so you know i had um you know, three young well actually two young kids at the time uh i was in a you know a, a great job before that i liked but i had a, an itch that i needed to scratch and yeah. um you know it, it, it was ridiculous you know throwing in that job and mortgaging our house in order to set the business up but i just thought yeah there's never a good time to do this so you need to be brave um that's what i would say um i think that you need to be very resilient as well you know it's it's hard i remember um yeah i remember we when we set the business up we anticipated that the first few sales would be really simple because we were selling to people that had bought our previous product before in our last yeah. business and you know it wasn't that simple at all they yeah they didn't buy our products you know they didn't always you know who we thought were kind of really close contacts you know they didn't necessarily always return our phone calls and the biggest problem is as soon as people know it's your own business they don't want to hurt yeah. your feelings so even if they think it's a mm. rubbish idea they won't tell you that because they yeah. think oh well, I don't know. You know whereas you'd rather just people were honest yeah. Um, so you definitely need that resilience. You definitely need a really good support network. So yeah. for me, it was my co-founder, as I say, when he was up, yeah. I was down and vice versa. But also you know, my wife, you know, incredibly yeah. fortunate that she was able and, and encouraging to to support me um, on this. Um, uh, what else do I think? I think you need to be a bit cynical as well. Um, you know, there's lots of, if you're not careful, you can waste a lot of time and a lot of money speaking to mm-hmm. people or buying stuff that you, you're told that you need. Um, yeah. And, you know, that, that's not helpful. So you need to you need to start with a bit of cynicism, I would say, uh, um, which, yeah. you know, isn't necessarily easy for everybody. Um, 
there's lots more, but they're the immediate yeah. ones that come to, come to mind. Yeah, thank you. Really helpful. Okay, so you told us what you love about your role. Tell us about the main challenges or frustrations. Um, things never go quickly enough. You know, you want things to happen quicker than they do. Yeah. Um, I think that that's a frustration. And we are going pretty quickly. You know, we are yeah. 50%. Our, our, our business is all about growth. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just enough to kind of stay the same size or make profit. It's the key measure is how much bigger are we this year than last year. So yeah. we're growing fast. We've grown about 50% between this year and last year. But that's still not fast enough. You know, I'm a yeah. bit of a, an adrenaline junkie. Um, so, yeah, that, I think the challenge is, I mean, ultimately the buck stops with me, you know, and yeah. um, if there's a problem, um, you know, ultimately it, it comes down to me. Um, so that's, yeah. you know, that's not, not for everybody. Um, yeah. I think also you know, occasionally there will be well, situations where, somebody is no longer right for us or we're no longer right for them you know perhaps yeah we can't um you know what they want from their role we don't have the structure or the maturity or whatever to be able to support that so um it's really difficult you know having conversations yeah. with people that you know perhaps their future lies elsewhere you know that's the, that's yeah. not a nice part of the job whatsoever um I think the other thing, just from a practical perspective, is um, which won't suit everybody. Because every day is different, um, I can't get into any kind of routine. And mm. that's really difficult. You know, one morning I have to get up at half past five. The next yeah. morning, actually, I don't need to do anything until 10 o'clock. So it's quite difficult. You know, there's a lot of people who like knowing exactly what time they get up what time yeah. they need to leave, where, what time they're going to get their coffee, when they're going to go for a run or to the gym. It, yeah. it's, not, it, it's not that easy when you're running yeah. your own business and the buck stops with you. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for sharing those insights. Really, really interesting and helpful to know. Um, when you look back on the work you've done so far, um, can you tell us about your proudest moment? Ooh, proudest moment. Um, I think that there's probably a few examples here. I think when we when we raised that investment two and a half years ago, um, that was a really proud moment. You know, the fact that somebody and we had I think four or five offers from organisations who wanted to invest money in the business, and and you know once we finally got that done and signed and and you know, there was a value on the business and somebody wanted to be part of, of the journey. That was a really proud moment. Um, we, we recently signed our first seven figure deal. So what, what we mean by that, by seven figures is it's worth more than a million pounds a year. Um, so winning and launching that was, was hugely, um, a hugely proud moment. You know, a lot of people yeah. sacrificed a lot. You know, there were people couple of people kind of postponed their holidays people were working bank holidays yeah yeah not through our instruction but just you know they were committed to kind of making this work so that was that was yeah. a proud moment um and i also I, we, we've had a couple of what are called boomerang employees so people who've mm. left nudge um but actually then come back again you know perhaps the yeah. grass wasn't greener like they thought and that is a really proud moment as well when somebody comes back to us um, yeah, and we 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 uh, we've been known with a couple of people who've left to keep their email open. So it's a really strong message saying, look, you know, if it doesn't work out, you can just slot yeah. back in here. Your emails will be how it was. So just creating that yeah. kind of open, um, welcome culture has been a nice, um, yeah, nice technique there as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Now, let's go all the way back to the beginning, Tim. When you were at school, tell us what you wanted to do when you grew up. Um, I, I don't remember. You know, I, I don't, I don't, you know, some people say, oh, you know, I always wanted to run my own business or be a racing car driver or whatever. Um, I think I, when I was very young, I wanted to swim in the Olympics. So there was a mm -hmm. very good swimmer at the time called Adrian Morehouse. 
Um, but I think by the time I got to about 13, I realised I wasn't actually cut out for that. Um, I remember my work experience at school. I um, went to the local solicitor's office and yes. um, we, I, I remember sitting in this kind of wood panelled room listening to the solicitor kind of dictating to uh, <laughs> one of those old school, do you remember those things? Dictaphones, yeah, I can't remember what they're like called. Yeah, yeah, dictaphone. So he sat there dictating these letters for his secretary to then type up. And within a day and a half, I was like, oh, my God, I, I don't want to do this to This is so boring. Um, but I managed to kind of wangle my way out to reception. And I spent the rest of the two weeks on reception just talking to people yeah. and photocopying and making coffee. And, um, you know, that's what I thought. Right, I definitely don't want to be a solicitor. Uh, yeah. But actually, I love being in amongst people and talking to people and yeah. meeting new people. Um, so, yeah, that that's as much as I can remember, I'm afraid. Yeah. And so when it came to choosing A-levels and uni, what, what you mm. know, what informed those decisions in terms of the subjects you chose? I can't really remember about A-levels. Um, it was a long time ago, Joe. Um, uh, a long, long time ago. <laughs> Uh, I I didn't do particularly well at my A-levels. Um, I got an A, a B, a C and a D, which was the limit of my ability. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm certainly not an A-star um, student. Um, but so I think I think I probably just settled on the A-levels, which I knew that I enjoyed. Um, yeah. When it came to uni, so I did... Geography and environmental science is kind of mixed course. Um, and I just, I like being outside. And I thought, you know, yeah. geography is probably a good good way of, of getting myself outside. Um, yeah. But I think when I, back then, I started to kind of show a bit of interest in, in business. And so yeah. I did as many kind of management and business modules as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think my advice is do something that you enjoy because if you if you enjoy it, you'll probably fulfil your potential. It won't become a drag. Yeah, yeah. And were you talking to anybody at that point about careers and you know the direction you might want to go in? I seem to remember filling in like some questionnaire where you had to mark on a pencil these different boxes and then you sent it off and then three weeks. I mean it. it Online, it would, there'll be an app now that would do it in five yeah. minutes, but this kind of process that then came back and said I was be my skills and interests would be perfectly suited to zookeeping or hairdressing or <laughs> dentistry or something like that. I was like, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure I agree with this. Um, but beyond that, I don't really remember much, much yeah. support. Um, I just, as I say, I just knew that I like being outside and I like meeting lots of people. Yeah. Um, and I think it was about around that time. I went, I went traveling after uni for a year and I worked in a, a complete hothouse call center for American Express where you had to you had to sell life insurance on the phone. So you're phoning people up. Yeah. And if you didn't sell eight policies on the phone um, in a day, you didn't come in the next day. Wow. And wow. As brutal as that was. You know, I learned a huge amount and yeah. I actually, you know, I, I worked out within a week or two how to kind of get the eight sales and then I quite enjoyed it. You know, I like that, yeah. like that challenge. So that was a big inspiration for me as well. Yeah. So was that when you were in Australia, that job? That was when I was in Australia, yeah. So I, wow. um, Harsh. Uh, I, <laughs> oh yeah, it's terrible. So I, I, I left. So after uni, I got a job locally where my parents lived, um, and that that was that was great. Um, but it was quite a big company, and it was there I realised, yeah. you know what, I'm not really suited for big companies. Um, so then I went, but I managed to kind of use that to pay off some debts, save up some money. So I went travelling, and I think I was away for about four or five months by the time I got to, to Australia, and I knew I really yeah. needed some money. I I did fruit picking. Uh, I, I, I settled down anticipating working on this fruit farm um, for a couple of months. And then I have to admit, within half a day, 
when I realised that I was picking rock melons, which um, <laughs> you know I'm not a big guy, I'm not strong. I, I <laughs> in the heat picking rock melons, I didn't last long. So I was like, right, I need to get to Sydney and go and get a job where I can sit in an office <laughs> um, in air conditioning. Uh, so yeah, it, but it was great. I mean, and you know, I had no choice. I had I had no I had about yeah. hundreds of dollars left. And yeah. I needed to get this job quickly. I was living on the floor of somebody's kitchen at the time. Um, so, yeah, it was a, a great experience. Yeah. I think what's nice about all of those roles and even your work experience is, even though it, it um, you realise you didn't want to pursue one of those paths, it still taught you something because, you, you know, you... Yeah. you you know, you're not going to look back wondering now if you could have, if you would have loved being a lawyer because you had that experience mm. and it showed you that actually that wasn't for you and that actually you rather more enjoyed the reception area that was, you know, bustly and so on. Um, and yeah. um, and I'm really curious in the in the sales role in Australia, um, I think that I think sales sc- skills are are really important in all walks of life. But at what point um, did you realise, yeah? I'm, pretty good at this I mean obviously the fact you kept your job I guess is a bit of a clue but I guess at what point did what made you enjoy it and realize yeah there's something here I'm quite good at this uh I think it was uh as as I say I kind of realized well I haven't been fired so I must be all right at it and yeah Yeah. it's nice to do things that, that you're okay at um but I think also what I really appreciated was I like to be in control of how much I yeah. earn. You know, I wanted there yeah. to be a direct correlation between the effort that I put in and how much I earn. And yeah. you get that in sales. The more you, yeah. the harder you work, the more you sell, the more money you make. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I I liked that kind of very simple mechanism. Um, yeah. Which you don't necessarily get in all, all careers. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So I'm guessing you came back to the UK after that experience in Australia. So tell us what happened next. Yeah. So then I went back to the organisation where I'd worked before, um, straight yeah. after uni. And so my advice there is never burn any bridges. You know, even if yeah. you think, if you, if you really dislike an early job or your boss or whatever, just don't, it's just not worth it. Don't burn any bridges. So... You know, yeah. they, they welcomed me back. And that was brilliant um, because I actually, I, I, they didn't quite go there. I, I did, I was a, a postman for a week. When I first came back, yeah. um, I, whilst I was kind of working through, you know, getting a job back at, at this, this other company and I had no money because I've just, you know, come from around the world. I, uh, I was a postman for a week, which was great cause again because I was outside. But yeah. anyway, I then went back to the company and while well, I really worked out what I wanted to do. And so I knew that I wanted to work with people. I knew I yeah. wanted to be in a sales role. By then, I'd also realized that I still had a bit more capacity to learn. And yeah. so I wanted to, I, I set about getting a job that allowed me to do some extra form of qualification, um, yeah. which the company which I ended up at allowed me to do that. Yeah. All right. So tell us about that. Tell us about that first job and and the extra curriculum yeah. qualifications and so on. Yeah. So that was um, that was an organisation that, uh, and you know, this will help you realise where the kind of the idea for Nudge came from. So that was an organisation that built a piece of software that helped employers administer their employee benefits. So mm-hmm. yeah, pensions, as an example, are. They're not, not so much now, but certainly back then, 20 years ago, they were really complicated administratively. But if you wanted to join yeah. a pension, you had a pack of information about that thick, and you, it was just a nightmare. So we set about building a uh, building a bit of software that helped people join their pensions online. Um, yeah. So uh, because we were dealing with pensions, the qualifications were something called the FPC, the Financial Planning Certificate, okay, um, yeah. which doesn't doesn't exist now it's, it's become something else now um so uh i as i said I'd, i knew that i didn't want to work for a big company um because yeah. the place i've been kind of before and after traveling was relatively big um 
And so this, this organization I joined, which was called Thompson's Online Benefits, I think I was employee four or five, so it was super small. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that was an amazing experience because when I joined, we didn't have a product, we didn't have any clients, but we had kind of an idea. And so yeah. although it wasn't my business, although I wasn't a founder, I still felt like an entrepreneur from that yeah. kind of very young age that I was at. Um, so yeah. I was there for 11 years and it was during that process that my business partner and I realised that well, it's all very well helping people join pensions, but what about helping them understand them in the first place, which is where the idea of yeah. the came from. Yeah. So in terms of um, milestones through that 11 year journey, can you can you talk to us about what that looked like in terms of roles and responsibilities? Yeah. And highlights? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so my, when I first joined the organisation, I was doing administration. So um, we, yeah, we had uh, lots of paper that needed filing and spreadsheets that needed kind of cross-checking. And we had to, um, we had to make sure that employees, when they joined this pension scheme, that, you know, all the paperwork was in order. Um and alongside that, I was starting to, to do some sales. So yeah, um, literally had the old yellow pages and a, yeah. one of those old school telephones. And we were phoning up companies and saying, yeah, can we come and talk to you? Look, yeah, we think we've got a solution here that can help help reduce your administration and help your employees better appreciate their pensions. And then we'd get on the train and we'd go up to the other end of the country and we'd get in the taxi and go and sit and get some business park and and kind of pitch pitch to these people. Yeah. We didn't have laptops at the time, so it was all kind mm. of flip charts. Um, yeah. And then that uh, that then evolved in parallel was doing these exams. And so by the time I'd completed the exams and passed the exams, I'd got a bit of experience. So then I started having my own quota. And so what that means is yeah. rather than me then being the bag carrier, you know, I'm the mm-hmm. person that's actually doing the selling. And yeah. um, I did pretty well sold some good deals there um and then and it was it was early on in that journey that our my my boss at the time the founder of the business um was very generous with his time and and gave me exposure beyond the job so uh, as an example i remember one afternoon him kind of walking across my my desk uh we probably had 30 people by that point and tapping on the shoulder and said, come with me. So I kind of, you know, whatever it is, stood up from the desk, followed him out, and he and he jumped in a taxi and we went to a meeting. And before I know it, we were negotiating the lease on a new office. Oh, and wow. I was like, you know, this has got nothing to do with my role, but he was just teaching me, you know, the other side yeah. of business, um, mm. which, you know, really kind of whet my appetite and I think set me up for those types of, you know, actions yeah. and responsibilities that you have as a business business leader. Um, and then the, I guess the key milestone came with that business when because I'd been there at the very beginning, I was given shares, so I was given some share yeah. options. And so there came a point where that business sold 30% of itself to a, yeah. to a company. And that allowed, because I was a shareholder, that allowed me to get a bit, a bit of money. And that yeah. is then what I used that money to, money to then set much up. So um, yeah. it was a brilliant, it was a brilliant experience. Yeah, it sounds it. Yeah, entrepreneurship in training, fantastic. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely. And and at what point during that journey did you and your co-founder sit down and say, "Hey, we've got an idea here, and actually, we think it's got legs." Um. So I think. We, when we thought we've got an idea, it was probably 2011, where at that point we were doing more and more work with US businesses, so people like Google yeah. and Apple and Facebook, and we heard about them. So the US tends to be about four or five years ahead of the UK from an employee benefits perspective. So what they yeah. do now, we'll be doing in four or five years' time. and. We started hearing these organizations talking about financial wellness and financial literacy and financial yeah. education for their employees. And we thought to ourselves, 
there's a pretty good chance that you know, this is going to land in the UK and there's nobody currently providing that service in the UK. And then meanwhile, when we kind of took a step back and thought what was happening, you know, a macro level in the world, we could see that money was becoming more and more complicated and, and therefore the, the dangers of poor financial management were coming more, um, you know, more significant. We could also see that there were, you know, booming, booming wealth in places like India and China. So millions, yeah. if not billions of people with, with money who they hadn't necessarily had it before. And therefore there was going to be a real yeah. skills gap. Um, and so, so when, when the Thompson's, the third last business then sold part of itself and, and we got those shares, we had no yeah. excuse then. You know, we had, we had yeah. an idea. We thought it was going to be big. We had a bit of money, not enough, but we had yeah. a bit of money to then kind yeah. of chuck caution to the wind and, and set the business up. Yeah. And many people talk about ideas or talk about starting businesses. I think they call them sofapreneurs. So what do you think was the difference between you guys just talking about it and you actually taking action? Uh I've not heard that phrase, but I like that, sofapreneurs. It's really easy, sofapreneurship, actually doing it. Yeah. yeah a bit different. Um, I, I think it's each other. You know, had, had mm. it, there's never a good time to do this stuff. As I said, I had yeah. two kids at the time. Um, it, was, it was a ridiculous decision, but um, me and my business partner were quite competitive and we egged each other on. And, yeah. you know, neither of us wanted to blink first. And it's, it's very immature. But, you know, <laughs> it works uh, because, yeah. you know, we, we, we kind of pushed each other. I think also, you know, we went to great efforts to make sure, to the point I emphasized earlier, that we didn't burn any bridges with our, the place yeah. we were leaving. So yeah. if it was a complete disaster and we spent all our money, we were pretty confident yeah. that actually we could eat humble yeah. pie and go back to our last place. Yeah. So, so that helped. And do you know what life? can be sure and I just think you know as I try and encourage my kids now just take every opportunity you get you know if you offered something yeah. just say yes you know yeah you, you you you're very unlikely to regret doing things you there's every chance that when you get to older age you might regret not doing things so just yeah just have a go um that's what yeah. I'd say yeah yeah thank you <laughs> all right so you 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 go it alone, you start this new business. So I guess, um, you know, talk us through, I guess, a, a whistle-stop tour of those nearly 10 years. Um, what did that journey look like? And, yeah, I mean, from two to nearly 100, yeah, it really yeah. interesting times. So tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so there's been a few different chapters. So I think chapter one was from when we set the business up until probably the first three years. Uh, yeah. And that's where it was just the two of us. We were building the product. Um, yeah. It was like hard, hard graft. Um, and then we started to get some some traction. So the second chapter was when we uh, started to you know, get some good clients, people like Samsung, so you know, well-known yeah. names. And they were paying us, and then we were using that money that they were paying us to invest more in the product that got the product better. And, and that, that route is called organic growth. So rather yeah. than going and borrowing money off somebody else, you're, you're yeah. winning clients, getting money, and recycling that. It, it wasn't a very fashionable way to grow a business back in mm. 2015, 2016. But we knew that we wanted to keep control of the business. And yeah. we knew that you know, we needed to make, if we're, if we're talking to people about better managing their money, we need to be financially sound ourselves as a business rather yeah. than kind of raising lots of money and creating problems. Yeah. So um, that was kind of chapter two, and that saw us up to about 30 people. And then um, we, and that, that was really where we had just had a solution in the UK. And then as I say, we, we knew that this was a global problem. But yeah. we knew that before we could, we shouldn't run before we could walk. So we made yeah. sure the solution was really robust in the UK before we then went globally. Um, so chapter three was starting to win some of the global deals that we did. And then chapter four is the last 
two and a half years, which have been fueled by us eventually raising this money from the yeah. what's called a growth equity firm. So an organisation yeah. that buys a percentage of the business at this valuation, with the idea being that in the future the business will be worth even more, and therefore their yeah. junk will be more. That that is their business. Um, yeah. And so yeah, for the last two and a half years we've been um, been growing very quickly. We've yeah. trebled in size in that two and a half year period. Wow. And I'm really curious, at what point along the journey did you feel like, yes, we did the right thing? Uh, when we got How long did clients. it take? <laughs> 50 uh, clients. Yeah, 50 clients. Um, that took, I think that probably took about four or five years. So it took a long yeah. time. So, yeah. you know, it takes a long time. But, you know, once the ball bit like a ball rolling down a hill you know once it's yeah. got a bit of momentum it then just kind of goes under its own steam so it's very yeah. tough to get it going to start with you know big rock yeah but it's now rolling and uh, and uh, yeah it's great yeah and in those early days did you and your co-founder ever think about you know um going back to the old place or did you always have faith that it yeah. was going to be a success we, we always have faith Always have faith. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the closest we got was uh, it was a particularly bleak winter, like a, a year and a half in, and you know hadn't earned any money, and uh, our boiler broke, and there was a storm, and our window broke. And I was like, oh my god, you know this would have been really simple a year and a half ago. I could have just paid for it, and now I've got no money. Uh, yeah. So you know that 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 was probably the closest, but. You know, once you've got this momentum, you just yeah. need to kind of embrace it. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't plan for boilers breaking when you're taking the leap of faith, do you? No. No, it was really depressing. It, it was um I said it was a really cold winter and uh in the and it was just before Christmas. So we had to decamp and like carry the turkey to my mum's oh. house. For Christmas, and then uh, I had to then come and sit in the house on my own on Boxing Day with the plumber trying to fix the boiler. It was yeah, a bleak <laughs> moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, well done for sticking with it because I'm sure yeah, I'm sure during that period, um, maybe not um, you know those that close support system that you mentioned earlier, but I'm sure there were concerned family members and friends saying, "Hey, mm. you know, are you sure?" And it's, I guess yeah. it's quite yeah. hard to, no, yeah. Yeah. No, it was, right. uh, yeah, I'd say in, in many regards, it was a silly thing to do, but I'm glad we did it. Yeah, it paid off. So yeah. I guess that brings us to today on the journey. Um, so, so looking back on the journey so far, um, what's been the high? Uh, the high? Um uh, I think, I think as I say, it's launching this this seven figure deal. You know, that's that's yeah. the big thing for us. Um, you know, that is immensely proud, and as a result, there's an extra seven hundred and twenty thousand employees who we're helping better understand their money. So yeah. yeah, the there's with every month or quarter that passes, mm -hmm. there's a there's a new high. So no, it's yeah. a great yeah, it's, it's it's an exciting time. Yeah. And again, looking back on the journey so far, um, can you tell us about, I think we've talked about some some kind of challenges, but I'm wondering if you could tell us about, um, you know, how you've coped personally. Have there been any limiting beliefs you've had to overcome or, you know, major failures? Um, so I'm not sure people will be familiar with imposter syndrome, but you know, I think that that's pretty, you know, pretty common feeling for a lot of people. So this is this idea that you you feel inadequate, you know, you don't feel equal to the people that you're speaking with. You think they're more experienced mm -hmm. or they're more knowledgeable or they're more charismatic or whatever it is. So there's there's definitely, you know, a healthy dose of, of that throughout. Yeah. Um I think you uh i tend i tend to find that 
you know, when things get really tough, then actually it's something inside me um, kind of injects a bit of adrenaline and, and sees me, me through it. Um, I do a lot of sports. I do a, a lot of running, as we talked about earlier. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I've been in some pretty dark places at the end of a marathon or a half marathon where you just need to kind of knuckle down and just yeah. crack on. And I think that's probably helped me. That idea that yeah. I know this is going to get better, and I'm just going to smash it through this difficult period. So, I think probably the most difficult period we've had was earlier this year. Um, I'm not sure if, if people will be aware or remember, but um, in March this year, there was a, a bank called Silicon Valley Bank or SVB that um, got into a bit of trouble in the US, and unfortunately. As a result of that, um, people got really worried. And so everybody that had money with that bank pulled it out. And of course, if yeah. a bank doesn't have any money in it, it can't exist anymore. And so yeah. between the Thursday when we heard that there were some problems, um, uh, you know, that, that was really worrying. We had employees saying, yeah. we know you bank with them. Are we going to get paid on time? We had clients who were trying to pay money into a bank account that we knew we wouldn't be able to get money out of. Yeah. Um, and that that was a really dark time. And uh, and I just I spent a lot of time walking, walking the dog, mm. trying to get my head straight that weekend. Fortunately, um, HSBC came in at the last minute and, and rescued yeah. that bank. And I remember the relief, the relief at eight o'clock Monday morning when I was walking to work. Ten minutes later, thinking, right, who who are we going to have to let let go first, and then yeah. have my AirPods in, listen to the news, and they said HSBC had rescued them, and that that was kind of a huge huge yeah. relief. But it was so I think I kept calm. I didn't make any knee jerk decisions, mm. you know. In the meantime, um, so yeah, again, it comes it comes down to that resilience and, and knowing that yeah. everything will be all right in the end. You just need to kind of yeah. see yourself through this tricky period. Yeah. And you mentioned running and walking as, I guess, ways yeah. to um, cope with that imposter syndrome or those dark days. Are there any other strategies yeah. you might like to share with the audience? Um, I, If I've got to really focus on something, then I'll listen to white noise. So I'll go to mm. YouTube and yeah, Google white noise and um, and you know that really helps me if I'm trying to get my head around something really quite tricky or um, you know understand something. Just I cut out all of that distraction. And my brain is yeah. easy, easily distracted. Um, so that that's a technique that I, that I use. Um, I think also I write a lot of stuff down. You know whether it's kind of lists or pros and cons. Yeah. Um, and I find that helps. It just kind of creates a bit of logic to your thinking. Um, yeah. So yeah, that uh, aside from that, and then I, you know, I've got a couple of people who you know I know that I can rely on for support. You know, if there's a problem yeah. that I'm really trying, trying to kind of struggle to get work my way through, there's a couple of people I can phone them up and say, "What's your advice here?" I think that's really yeah. important. You know, build a network of of trusted, um, you know, trusted friends. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Mm. Um, I'm curious about the role of mentors, role models and sponsors on your journey yeah. so far. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, so, you know, my business partner, yeah, absolutely, yeah, kind of a mentor, sponsor and, and, and everything else. Um, the... the I think the other key person is the founder of the last business, the guy who took me to the rent uh, rent negotiation yeah. meeting, and, and in actual fact, he's now chairman of our business. So oh. yeah, he he's um, yeah he's he's a big uh, yeah big support. Um, uh, I've got a lot of time for, for him and rely on him a lot. Um, and it was also the finance director or CFO, chief financial officer. In our last business, um, yes. yeah, he's been quite instrumental for me in terms of, you know, understanding the how to build a stable business, and and I've caught up with him probably a couple of times in the last twelve months just for bits of advice. Um, yeah. 
so you know I, I i work hard to make sure that i've got kind of a network of people who you know are happy to help me you know if i yeah. really need it and i'd encourage others to do that as well yeah yeah absolutely thank you so if we um if we were to offer advice to the audience around any i i guess uh beneficial educations or trainings or qualifications that might help them if they want to work in this industry or you know aspire to be an entrepreneur or ceo themselves one day do you think there's any essentials um i don't think yeah i think um i think the main you know the main skill or qualification or however you want to describe it is just doing something that you enjoy um because if you enjoy something it doesn't feel like work you know it feels like yeah. a hobby and therefore you know kind of the salary or what have you flows so so that would be my advice i think other than that just expose yourself to as many opportunities as possible you know even if it's not yeah. within your job role speak to people you know i'm i'm yeah, I love going to parties or events where I don't know anybody because it gives me an opportunity to, I'm a bit weird in that regard, it gives me an opportunity <laughs> to speak to new people and make new connections and get ideas. Um, so yeah. just, yeah, do something that you enjoy and speak to as many people as possible. Um, yeah. You know, there's loads of loads of networking events, um, you know, in, in the main cities, uh, you know, around around the UK, particularly focused on, inspiring internship um so just yeah. get yourself involved in those and you'll realize that there's other people with the same aspiration for you and um you will immediately feel part of the community which is um incredibly valuable yeah thank you for anyone out there who's thinking oh my god networking you've got to be joking that frightens the life out of me as someone who clearly enjoys it um what tips would you give to that person? Um, ask, start with asking questions and really listen. So, yeah. you know, I've had lots of kind of conversations with people where they just talk to you for you know, 10 minutes and, and then they go, sorry, what did you ask me? So I think it's yeah. about, um, you know, if you're in doubt of, you know what you're going to say to somebody just have a couple of questions you know up your sleeve ready ready to yeah. ask and then really listen to what somebody's saying and the conversation will then naturally flow from there yeah um but yeah it is it is a really difficult thing but the the gain the value that you can get from it is um is definitely worth the effort yeah yeah, yeah thank you um, we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, what qualities make for a good um, founder or entrepreneur. Um, are there any other soft skills that you want to call out that you think are particularly helpful in your industry or sector? Um, I think communication is the most important, being able to yeah. communicate really clearly, um, whether that is through speaking uh, whether that is through writing, um, yeah. you know, one of my kind of peeves that really annoys me is is when people write in an overly formal kind of technical way, whereas actually, yeah. you know, I really encourage people to just write as you speak, and then it's yeah. so much easier for somebody to kind of digest what you're actually saying. Um, so I think that's important, and I, I always encourage, you know people at the beginning of their careers who particularly at Nudge to, to be worldly wise you know I know it's not fashionable to read a newspaper anymore but it is really yeah. important you know if you understand yeah. what's happening in business you know in in the news in politics um you know that gives you a distinct advantage in coming up with ideas or being able to network yeah. and talk yeah. about things um so yeah, I really encourage people to you know get a diverse have a diverse source of news as well. So yeah. they really understand what's happening in the world. You know, that will help you in space. Yeah, thank you. What does the future hold for your industry? 
Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I think that uh, I think we're very fortunate in that I don't think there's anything in the world that connects us all like money. You know, it doesn't matter mm. if you've got more money than you know what to do with or you're living yeah. week to week. Everybody has personal finance. So yeah. you know, we, I think we are the only business in the world that has a target addressable market of 8 billion people. You know, I think everybody in the yeah. world deserves much. So I think you know, there's massive growth opportunities. Um, yeah. I think also people are becoming a bit fed up with the way that the financial services industry works. I think people don't trust banks and insurance companies. Yeah. They know that it's perhaps a bit of a ruse to try and be sold something. Um, so I expect that um, kind of that to continue this idea that people want a safe space to learn about money rather than yeah. something that's kind of full of adverts and you know, influencers mm. or you know whatever the phrase is. Um, and I think that the world is getting smaller in many regards. You know, I think COVID accelerated the prominence uh, around video calls and therefore yeah. the world in many regards feels a lot smaller. So I think that we can expect from a kind of workplace perspective, from an HR perspective, I, I think we can expect a much more consistency across the world going forward. Um, which yeah. is great for our business because our message is all about providing people with equitable support regardless of yeah. kind of who they are or where they are so the future yeah. is, is very bright for Nudge. Yeah and I have to ask you what is your view on cryptocurrency? Um, I can't quite work out what problem it's trying to solve mm. so I think that you know, a lot of people talk of it as an investment, but that would be like, I mean, it's a currency. So, you know, that would like be like buying, I don't know, US dollars as an investment. I think you buy yeah. US dollars if you're going to America and you want to yeah. buy something. I can see the use of crypto if you want to buy something where, you know, the website or whatever only accepts crypto. But to buy it beyond that, I don't quite understand it. So I think it's very, very dangerous. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And of course, this is not financial advice, but... Uh... <laughs> Certainly not. Certainly not. Thanks. No. <laughs> so for anyone want, who wants to find out more about your industry, your sector, um, entrepreneurship, running a business, where would you point them in terms of, I don't know, any... of. Um, any reg any bodies or websites or podcasts or books? Do you have any favourite place to, s to send people? Um, so I think in terms of our, our business, our, our website is um, you know pretty good place to start. So yeah, it's nudge-global.com. Um, I think that you know on Twitter um, or X now, whatever it's called, you know I I read lots of interesting. Uh, resources there around entrepreneurship and you know you yeah. can find this stuff pretty quickly and follow some key people and you know, before you yeah. know it you, know, you can get kind of a real in-depth experience there um the i think other than that um as i say most of the cities in the uk have some kind of active program to encourage entrepreneurship um yeah. so here in london there's innovate uk for example and they run lots of events and yeah. and yeah, you, as soon as you kind of show a bit of interest in one of those, there's all sorts of kind of opportunities for learning that come from that. Um, yeah. So yeah, good old Google. I think it's a pretty good place to start <laughs> depending on where you are in the UK. <laughs> Thank you. And what would you say to somebody who's listening who isn't employed or is employed but they're in an organisation that doesn't offer your service um where could they go and get i don't know a bit of help with financial literacy as a you know as a direct consumer as it were um well as a direct consumer it's a real problem there's a real gap um because you know i believe for it to be really effective the financial education needs to be impartial as soon as yeah. there's some 
organization using education to try and promote their services or sell their products, it, it almost becomes worthless. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's the, so I think the first place to look is your employer because you know, they are in a position to fund this product uh, and therefore you know, make sure that the service you're getting is impartial. Um, yeah. I think, you know, if you're not fortunate enough to work for an organization that has this, you, there isn't a simple answer. You're going to struggle yeah. um, because, uh, you know, even the likes of, Kind of money saving expert you know all of their content is sponsored um mm. so yeah it, you, you need to be really quite careful and so i would say is just have a healthy sense of um kind of cynicism i talked earlier about being a bit yeah. cynical um so if you are reading something if you are getting advice just try and really make sure you understand the motivations of the person who's telling you it um because yeah. if you understand that and you're clear on that and you're happy with their motivations, then great. But too many people uh, just kind of mindlessly follow instruction without really understanding where, where or, or why it might be coming from where it is. Yeah, thank you. I read a good book a few months ago by Claire I think it's Claire Barrett and she's an FT columnist and and she mm-hmm. she's written a book around uh, money and I think it's aimed at younger people and uh, it's it's actually really it really goes through a lot of the basics so I think for somebody mm-hmm. who can't get access to you know a great product like yours it could be a starting point yeah no definitely yeah, absolutely yeah there's yeah. Lot, lots of great you know books out there around this subject um but yeah. I say, unfortunately, it's a big problem and it's it's getting bigger. So yeah, uh, that's why we need every employer to provide nudge. Um, and if anybody can, I, I, you know, I've long said now it'd be brilliant if, for example, um, the government were able to fund this for people on universal credit. Um, yeah. You know what an amazing opportunity that would be. I say yeah. you just need that that sponsor, somebody who's prepared to pay for it, um, yeah. so the service can exist um, with impartiality. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, hopefully there's someone who's listening who uh, might be able to do that. Um, Yeah. Okay. Um, Tim, as we move towards um, wrapping up, um, we're really keen to get some general advice from you now. So what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were starting out in your career journey? I think that... um, it's the importance of kind of having a network and, um, you know, really having that kind of trusted suite of people mm. who can give you help and give you support and pick you up. Um, yeah. Yeah, ultimately, you kind of, you're going to need to, whether it's um, building a business uh, as a founder or whether it's running a business as a CEO, it can be quite lonely. Um, yeah. You know, you're on your own. And so I think yeah, having that network of people to provide you with support is is absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah. And and what would you say to young Tim who didn't know what he wanted to do, but was in that solicitor's office? Uh, there's never, you know, there's never a good time to mm. to set a business up. Um, but yeah, you need to be brave. Um, I think the other thing that I would have, uh, with hindsight, you know, perhaps done that I haven't done was learn to code, you know, learn software engineering, mm-hmm. you know, not because that's necessarily going to be my vocation, but just so I had a better understanding of how this stuff works. So, yeah, yeah it's my, my kids now, you know, they learn, learn it in school, you know, they're learning about. Uh, coding in school and I, I never had that opportunity but um you know I wish kind of as an extracurricular um uh yeah activity that I'd, I'd spend some time doing that yeah yeah thank you I think that's a really really great tip and I think there's so many great free online resources um 
on the learning platforms, but also YouTube where you can pick up some basic skills. And it's so valuable because especially if you're running a business and you're outsourcing something, you if you don't know the scope of what you're asking someone to do, it's very easy to have the wall pulled over your eyes and or you get the thing back, but you've no way of checking if it's right or maintaining it. So just to have a base level of understanding of some, of lots of these things, I think is so helpful. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, couldn't couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, what is your secret to happiness and fulfilment at work? Goodness. Uh, exercise. Yeah, I think exercise is key. I think um, you know, there's all sorts of science around um, yeah, endorphins. Um, but I think also for me, exercise provides a brilliant time to think. Um, yeah. And uh, I think you know, it's great to see the world as well. You know, rather than like, I can't think of anything worse than going to the gym and standing on yeah. a treadmill. I'd much rather like go out and run around somewhere and see stuff. So, yeah. yeah, I think exercise and I think, you know, even when things get really difficult, just see the bigger picture. You know, these moments, these tough moments are going to pass. Um, yeah. So I think that that's probably kind of the key two reasons of you know, where, where I've been able to do quite well. It, it's down to those two things, to see the bigger picture yeah. and continue to exercise. Yeah. Um, do you have any favourite quotes? Uh I like the quotes, who was it? Was it Gary Player who said, the harder I practice or the more I practice, the luckier I get? You know, I think there's a lot mm. of sense in that as well. Um, yeah. You know, of course, you know, there is luck. Uh, is, is definitely, there's some luck that is uncontrollable, but you know, at the same time, I strongly believe that there's a correlation between you know, how hard you work and, and how, how you do. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think that yeah, what I always say, again, to our youngsters is I believe that your 20s sets the trajectory for the rest of your career. You know, if you, yeah. if you get a momentum and you show progress in your 20s, I think that sets you up for the rest of your career. Yeah. Um, so when I'm recruiting, one of the things that I love to see, one of the things I look out for is if somebody has had promotions within one company, mm-hmm. that's a really mm. good sign. You know, that shows that they've yeah. had, had that promotion. What is a bit of a flag for me is somebody who only gets a promotion by skipping organisation. So yeah. I think, you know, make sure you find the right organisation, knuckle down and set that trajectory um, for, yeah. Uh, yeah, for in your 20s and then your 30s, 40s, 50s, your career will then fly from there. It's like compound interest. Yes, isn't it just? There we go. <laughs> Okay, Tim, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time and sharing all of your insights today. Are there any final words of wisdom or encouragement you'd like to share with the audience before we go? Uh, I don't think so. As I say, just, you know, enjoy, make sure you have no regrets. You know, when, when it comes to your final days, you won't have no regrets. And I think that you will perhaps regret not doing something but I can't think of too many examples of people regretting things that they have done because as you said you'll learn from it so yeah Yeah. no regrets okay brilliant thank you so much pleasure thank you for having me Thank you so much for joining Tim and I today. We really hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the world of CEOs and entrepreneurship. If you gained any value out of this episode, please help us out by sharing it with your friends and subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. And do share your feedback with us in the form of a rating. It really does help other people find us in Apple and Spotify and so on. And if you have any questions, comments or suggestions, feel free to get in touch with me directly. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, have a great week, whatever you're doing. And thanks again for tuning in.